And it's going to be for solely will be destroyed. Propellers, controls, wiring, fuel system. The bombs have to be placed in their racks very carefully. Crew members have ceased to exist as individuals. They are now 10 men teams. fighter after fighter. History is what brings us together. And I'm very proud that we have in our community so many active members of the Historical Society World War II of Korea Hovenflake. On the many places on our island, they try to keep alive the history of World War II, a war which has an enormous impact on the people of this continent. We can't take freedom for granted. It's not a free ticket. There still is an important reason to commemorate the soldiers who fought for our freedom and died for it some 70 years ago. We have to teach our children that freedom has to be fought for. So to keep them watchful and alert. We got two of those children here. And to cite Abraham Lincoln out of his Gettysburg Address on November 1863, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here. But it can never forget what it did here, that we were high, here highly resolved that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, <coughs> by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. So let's all have a memorable meeting today and not forget the words of those statesmen. Thank you. Um, I really can't do his, his, um, justice to the history of 490 in five minutes, but I'll give you a cottage history so that you get a rough idea of, of how it went. The group was activated in the 1st of October 1943 and it transferred to its um, home base which was Mountain Home, Idaho. Uh, after training, uh, they then would be moved on to the wherever they were going to go, which was this, this group was the European Theatre of Operations. Um, they became part of the 93rd Combat Wing, 3rd Air Division, um, and they flew their first combat mission on the 31st of May. They then flew 40 missions in B-24s, um, and then, they had to convert to the B-17s. They then flew 158 combat missions, uh, during which time they lost approximately 250 personnel. Uh, towards the end of the war, 
They then flew uh, what were called chow hand missions, five over Holland. Um, after VE Day, they then came to Europe and transferred French, Spanish, Belgian prisoner of war to centres for dispersal back to their hometowns or countries. Once the war had finished, the group was then to be deployed back to England, uh, to back to America. To do this, they left I, all aircraft left I, half on the 6th of July and the other half on the 8th of July, each aeroplane carrying 10 crew and 10 passengers. The ground personnel, plus any other personnel that were left, then departed on the 20, uh, leaving Southampton on the 26th of August uh, on the Queen Mary back to the States. So that a potted history of the group. Okay, so thank you very much. There are a couple of sources which helped us to learn more about the crew and the tragic event that occurred on the platform Thursday afternoon. First, there is the MACR, or the Missing Air Crew Report, devised to record relevant facts of the last known circumstances regarding missing air crew. And because there were three surviving crew members, these reports contain valuable eyewitness accounts of what happened inside the aircraft. Then, of course, we have Eric Swain, who provided us with pictures and interesting mission info. Third, Ben Anderson, the grand nephew of the ball turret colonel Jack Anderson. He sent us pictures, copies of letters that Chuck sent home. And, but also the diary in which we can read pretty much detailed information about those missions. This is uh, Charles Anderson or Chuck Anderson. And last but not least, in the search for more information about this man on the internet, I found an interview with John Ewald. He was the navigator of the crew and one of the three survivors of the crash. Uh, Brent was so kind to contact the Institute, uh, who did the interview in the year 2009 and retrieved the video. John is still living today, as I heard yesterday from Brent, um, but he's not doing well and suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but today he's with us in spirit and he will tell you the story of what he recalls of the war years. In the fall of 1944, I joined a B-17 combat crew for, in, uh, for training in uh, Mississippi and for staging for departure overseas. In January of 1945, the crew departed for the British Isles on Cunard Ocean Liner Aquitania and reported to the 490th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force, located in the East Anglia area of England. Well, who were these men in the crew? I'll introduce you to you, uh, one by one, by these uh, pictures. They were taken at the uh, high airfield. This is Jim uh, Island, he was from Chicago, Illinois. This is Charles Plotner, he was from Peking, Illinois. Well, Charles Anderson, he was from North Branch, Minnesota. Jack Hamilton, he was from Champaign, Illinois. Raymond Conroy, he was from Providence, Rhode Island, and Alfred Alcina, Brooklyn, New York. There was one member who was also aboard at Ecotania, that was uh, Charles Plotner, and he was first uh, a member of the Hunter crew, he's over here. So he later was transferred to the, to the base crew. And these were the three officers aboard, also the three survivors of the crash. It's uh, Charles Bates, he was the pilot, he was from Indianapolis, Indiana. Next to him is uh, Alice Smith. He was a co-pilot. He's still living today, but also not doing very well. But. And this is John Newwood, who spoke. And that is John E. Till. He was from Hainville, Alabama. He was a, a so-called pool gunner. So he hopped from one crew to the other, and just where he was needed. Uh, yeah, he joined. Now, what we do know of all these guys is that they flew the first mission on 2 March 1945. The target was Dresden, which was certainly not a milkrun, being far into Germany. However, the mission was quite uneventful, with moderate flag but inaccurate. Besides that, the Luftwaffe was not as powerful as they used to be, and bombers had a good Oscar, Oscar escort now. John Newell confirms that. Of course, what happened, what, what helped us in those days, this, those times, almost the end of the war, that the uh, P-51 fighters were now protecting us almost to the t to the target because they were able to attach a gasoline tank 
under the plane to give it more range. It used to be they couldn't go all the way with you because they ran out of fuel. They had to come back, but then they they, they, they added this gas tank, and when it was empty, they just dropped it. So they gave you an added sense yeah, of security. Yeah, so we had an added security, and then we uh, we also threw out chaff out of the airplane, which. Uh, the any aircraft people were shooting at the chaff rather than the airplanes because of their instrumentation for that. Yeah. Well, they were especially very happy with the little friends that they called uh, the fighters. On their second mission on 5 March 1945, with the synthetic oil plants and roulette as the target. Chuck writes in the log is following. Aborted on third, two thirds of the way to target because of a leak in an oxygen system. Dropped our bombs and ran like hell for home. One little friend, P-51, escorted us to the channel where another one picked us up. The fighters, however, did not protect the bombers against the immense flag, which now was the main concern of the airmen. Did you run into much anti-aircraft on your missions? Uh, not too many, not when we were known, no. In fact, I, uh, I did, in some of those missions, I did see other planes get damaged, but we were not hurt of it, hit at all in the first 12 missions. What did you think when you saw a plane shot down, going down? Well, you got, you got concerned because you, you might have been one. You might have been one. I, I looked out one day there and I saw the tail dis disappear off a plane that was off on the side there. You so have a sense of shock. Yeah. Were you ever attacked by German fighter planes on your missions? Not too much, no, because and but then we did have some flak. We saw flak, but then with that throwing out that chaff, you know, it, it, it helped some. But uh, that was where I got more concerned when you saw the the anti anti aircraft uh, flak. On April 5, 1945, the mission was to bomb the airfield at Unterschlauersbach, as you can see here on the map. Uh, eyes over here, Unterschlauersbach is over there. The flight to the target and back shouldn't have been that hard since most of it was over friendly area. In this period of the war, the Allies had advanced deep into Germany, closed the gap around the blue pocket, and were on their way to the album where they would link up with the Russians. So it's like this was the area they already had uh, liberated. Except this ball and the letters they didn't. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a milk run since the weather was bad, very bad that day. Actually, you might even wonder why they didn't let them fly. Anyway, at 7.51, 7 hour 51 in the morning, they took off and hours later they dropped their loads and returned home. Navigation, however, was a disaster in this bad weather and the planes were scattered all over. After a couple of hours, the lead planes needed to know where they are for the navigation. So they decided to have a visual check and fly under the clouds. And that's when it went all wrong. Well, anyway, to continue with this, we were flying at 1,000, around 1,000 feet over the Netherlands, which was still occupied by the Germans, and our B-17G was hit by ground fire and caught on fire. With fire somewhat around me, I release the escape hatch which was in the bottom of the plane up near the well that's where we got it on the airplane too. I dove out after I released the hatch because the fire was burning around me and I immediately pulled the ripcord on my parachute. I didn't I used to tell you when you're at the high altitude of 30,000 feet you should at least count to 10 or, or longer because you run out of air at the high altitudes but I pulled it right away. And the chute opened, and in less than a minute, I landed in water near Dordrecht, Holland, and was towed by my still open parachute because there was a wind blowing, and it pulled me up on a sandbar. So I didn't have to worry, worry about <laughs> drowning, <laughs> even though I had a Mae West you know, as part of my uniform. And after I was got on the sandbar, I was picked up by two German soldiers and taken to Dordrecht, where I received medical attention for some cuts and, bur and burns. It was a German doctor who took care of this. It's amazing. I didn't think they would do that, but they did. Were you the only survivor? Um, 
I don't want to get into that in too much detail, but I would say, uh, no, I was not the only one, but a lot of our crew did get lost. They, they never got out of the airplane. It was too low. In fact, I glanced up when I was coming down, and I saw somebody jump, uh, fall out of the plane, but the chute never oh, opened. That had to be a harrowing experience. But, uh, yes, it was, and I was very fortunate. Yes. If you want to think, look at it that way, because I'm here today. And some of those have not been here for me. The only ones getting out of time were navigator John Ewell, the co-pilot Del Smith Jr., and the pilot Charles Bates. However, Bates was thrown out of the plane after the explosion, and luckily his parachute opened. He was, however, badly wounded after he hit the water hard, and all three mentioned someone else getting out of the plane, but his parachute didn't deploy. Exactly what John told. This might either have been Alfred Alucino or James Island, the tail gunner, because both washed ashore later. Island on 20 April, 20 April and Alucino on May 7. This is a picture from our RAF reconnaissance flight in 1943, where you can see clearly uh, the Kiel Harbor, where we're going to in a couple of minutes. And um, there were uh, German bunker complexes over here, which you still can see right in front of them where the plane crashed, and uh, also over here, just like, as a matter of fact, the entire island was part of the Atlantic Wall and covered with uh, bunkers. And um, civilians from the village of Oudorp were only allowed two days after the crash to retrieve the bodies from the wreckage. In 1946, the seven men were brought to the American cemetery in neuville en in Belgium for a burial over there or for transport to their beloved ones home in the US. All were brought home, but except uh, John Till's, John Till, because his family chose to leave John with his uh, brothers in arms. Uh, this is the, the grave marker of John in the Belgium cemetery. Um, these are the, this is the head of Alfred Alucino, and this one is Charles Putnam back in the US. <coughs> and, but what happened? What happened with the three who survived? I, uh, I was paid, taken by truck and I joined a POW group called Stalag 34 in Transit. And uh, this group was of U.S. Air Force pilots, RAF pilots, a British Air ca uh, Army captain, and a Dutch police officer. And during the rest of April, the POW group was moved by steps north through Holland via Amersfoort, Alsmeer, then Helder to Westerschelling in the Frisian Islands on a way back to Germany. In other words, they were trying to get us back to Germany. But while we were in the Frisian Islands, the E Day occurred. So we never got back to Germany. Did you know that on the day it actually occurred, or was it later? Uh, no, we knew we knew the uh, we knew it two days ahead of VDE oh, Day. Did you? Yeah. In fact, they had us laying out at a camp somewhere, and as soon as we, they had heard about it, they took us in into a hotel. So we spent two days in a hotel in Western West. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a picture of the group uh, John is talking about. It's taken at, uh, at the hotel where they were taken to. Uh, three of the other uh, three other US airmen are in this picture. And actually, they were from a B-17 that made an emergency landing just half a mile from the crash site of the base group. Also, another B-17 from the 490 bomb group crashed minutes before near Sobos Dyke, also here on the island of Koryo for okay? Unfortunately, there were no survivors. Bates, Ewald, and Smith returned to the States and were able to grow old and have a family, but always had to deal with the fact that they were lucky and survived and the other friends didn't. This uh, is John Ewald in 2009 and Al Smith, the co-pilot, at a reunion. Well, this uh, was a story about the Bates crew, as we call them. We are now... Uh, ready for the part to the kill harbor where the ceremony will take place. Goedemiddag dames en heren, hartelijk welkom bij deze ceremonie. 
ceremonie. Ten ere van de, de bemanning van de B17 bommenwerper die hier op 5 april 1945 uh, hier voor de Keelhaven neerstortte. Ongeveer 200 meter uit de kust, recht uh, ja, waar al die stokken in het water staan. Maar allereerst wil ik uh, graag uh, waarnemend burgemeester de heer Lokker uh, uitnodigen hier om hier naar voren te komen voor het welkomstwoord. Na de Eerste Wereldoorlog dacht iedereen in Europa dat dit wel de laatste Europese oorlog zou zijn geweest. Een oorlog die ons met een schok in de moderne tijd heeft gebracht. Niets zou ooit meer hetzelfde zijn. En zonder de hulp van al die soldaten van de nieuwe wereld, Amerika en Canada, was de vrede niet snel gekomen. Toch gebeurde niet veel later het onvoorstelbare. Een nieuwe oorlog brak uit, nog gruwelijker en nog omvangrijker. En deze keer ging de oorlog niet aan Nederland voorbij. De leuze nooit meer oorlog verstomde in het geweld dat Nazi-Duitsland veroorzaakt. En opnieuw bracht de Amerikaanse en Canadese militairen de vrede. Een vrede die wij nu, 70 jaar na dato, mogen gedenken. Nee, mogen vieren. Daarom is het van groot belang dat wij elk jaar stilstaan bij degenen die voor onze vrijheid hebben gevochten. Die ervoor hebben gezorgd dat wij vrij onze mening kunnen uiten. Dat wij mogen geloven en denken zonder angst te hebben om te worden opgepakt en veroordeeld. Maar die vrijheid is wel een prijs. Onze persoonlijke inzet is en blijft nodig voor een rechtvaardige wereld. Een wereld waarin plaats is voor ieder mens. Waarin we tegenstellingen overbruggen. Want dat zal pas de oorlog kunnen voorkomen. Het paneel dat wij vandaag onthullen zal ons blijven herinneren aan die opdracht. Dank u wel. Ik heb de eer om te attend several ceremonies in mijn jaren hier in de Netherlands. En de effort en de liefde van de Dutch mensen continue to show to those who sacrifice so much is always very impressive. And it makes me eternally grateful um, that the United States has allies like the Dutch. Please allow me to reflect from my perspective as a pilot myself uh, on the mission that they performed that day. These men of the 850th Bomb Squadron, knowing they were tempting fate, flying at the back of the pack, as we say, still a technique that we try to avoid today, pressed on with their mission, even downing one of the most advanced and first jet aircraft of the day. And they fought to the very end. Please accept our sympathies for our grateful nations, as well as our thanks to our very good friends and the people of the Netherlands. Let us all remember, and remember with the purpose, to continue our strong partnership between nations as we work for a peaceful world that will still need the great warrior spirit as demonstrated by the, the crew of this B-17. Thank you for your time and the invitation and for remembering. Our look bedankt. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun split, cloud, split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung. I in the sunlit silence hovering there. I chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up, the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the wind, swept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew, and while with silent lifting mind I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touch the face of God. Why do you still march, old man, with medals on your chest? 
Why do you still grieve, old man, for friends you laid to rest? Why do your eyes shine, old man, when you hear those bugles blow? Tell me why you'd cry, old man, for those days so long ago. I'll tell you why I march, young man, with those medals on my chest. I'll tell you why I grieve, young man, for the friends I laid to rest. Through misty folds of gossamer stilk come visions of distant times when boys of very tender age marched forth to distant chimes. So young they were, with blossom cheeks, eyes shining bright and clear, scant knowledge of this sinful world, thought not of hate or fear. Their laughter rang through strange bare rooms, hardships they would soon know. All they thought was beyond their shores, stood a deadly, vicious foe. They left behind their boring life, they had nothing much to give. So they laid their lives upon the line, so you, young man, would live. With bayonet, gun and blossom cheeks, the innocence of their youth, they stood alone with fearsome pride and perceived the awful truth. The truth they learnt, they had to die, and that's hard when you are young. The gods of war had chosen them and stilled their youthful tongue. The guns they crashed, stukas dived, shells tore their flesh asunder. I smelt their blood, I watched them die. The warlords claimed their plunder. And as these warrior gods passed by, they smiled in obscene death. Gone were their apple blossom cheeks, scorched by burning breath. We buried them in a blanket shroud, their young flesh scorched and blackened. A communal grave newly dug in blood-stained gorse and bracken. And you ask me why I march, young man? I march to remind you all. But for those apple-blossomed youths, freedom would be lost to all. It was a blustery Thursday, right after Easter, April 5th, 1945. After a weekend off for the Bates crew in the countryside, continuing to awaken from a damp, cool winter, the crews of the Mighty Eighth were gathered for their next mission. The plan was to take off individually from their air bases in England and form up over France. Once assembled, they could travel to the target over Germany. As fate would have it, the weather was extremely poor over the rendezvous point, and the radio beacons were not functioning. Running out of time, the crew split off into what was known as bastard formation and made their way to the assigned target. They carried out their mission, dropped their bomb load, and raced for home. This small group of bombers was unfortunately too far north attempting to cross what remained of the Atlantic Wall still held by the Germans. They were hit. Fires erupted. Attempts to fight the fires were unsuccessful. With multiple engines on fire, the pilot, Lieutenant Bates, gave the order to abandon ship. John Ewald escaped. Ellis Smith escaped. Charles Bates escaped. The plane was estimated to be at only 300 feet at this time. One other crewman fell from the plane. His parachute did not have time to open. Those seven sergeants perished together. According to the record of the 96 bomb, bomb group, the plane caught fire, and exploded. Alfred Illuccino, Charles Anderson, Raymond Conroy, Jack Hamilton, James Ireland, Charles Plotner, and John Till were released from this life, having given the ultimate sacrifice. 
as with the loss of lace and war, the world suffered a great loss. of kinship and talents with these men. Each had brought joy and happiness to their friends and family during their short lives. According to my grandfather, his kid brother Chuck was a happy-go-lucky soul who was an avid fisherman and a hunter. Chucky would always come down during the hot summer days and spend time with us on the, on the river. He always had a smile on his face and was quick with a joke or riddle. He learned to be a butcher from his father, but enjoyed music the most, having spent time playing in the town band and with orchestras. The rest of his crewmates had similar stories all filled with talents and dreams. Sharing these and all other stories of these brave souls have everyone helps everyone connect to this piece of, of history. I want to thank the Foundation for their hard work and dedication in bringing each of the crew's stories forward and to tell the world about these young souls. And I want to thank everyone else for their attendance here today to join in commemoration of this crew. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to a view of the memorial panel with Brent Anderson and Colonel Gavis. Will please come forward to do the honors.
There she comes. You'll be amazed at the beautiful sound of those two right engines, each producing 1700 horsepower, resulting in a maximum speed of about 450 kilometers an hour. Lights on. People, let's wave because they can see you. on my own mm -hmm. to find out uh, a little bit more about the 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 crew the, the plane that my uncle was on mm -hmm. um, during the war I've been involved with the 490s now for about 25 years okay. so and then due to the contact over a period of time I became the historian I started doing some uh, internet searches mm -hmm. and I was lucky enough to come upon uh, this group here, the foundation. Yeah, it is op zich wel grappig verlopen, want normaal dan zoeken wij eigenlijk de familieleden op van yeah. de, de vliegenis. En deze kwam eigenlijk op een presenteerplaatje, want die contacteerde okay. ons. And so he started filling in more of the story about where it had crashed and how. Mm -hmm. En sindsdien hebben we al contact en ja, de, we hadden allebei wel wat informatie. Hij natuurlijk van zijn van zijn oom, yeah. zijn grootoom. En wij van de kant hier van het eiland, van getuigenverslagen. En dat ja. hebben we dus mooi bij elkaar kunnen leggen. En uh, Dennis was zo so kind to then give me a tour of the area and show me uh, the crash site en some of the things that the foundation was working on. En ja, zo is het eigenlijk het hele verhaal steeds verder gaan groeien. Er kwamen ja. steeds meer mensen bij, steeds meer partijen. En is het uh, ja, 
eigenlijk geworden wat we vandaag gezien hebben. I am part of a small community in England that live around I Airfield. And I Airfield is where the 490th bomb group were based. And that is from where the aircraft flew that crashed, that we commemorate today. And I had met the uh, co-pilot at some of the reunions, so that was a reason to come here. It was a dedication to a 490 crew. In de aanloop naar, het, uh, naar de ceremonie toe zijn er een hoop kleine dingetjes uh, ja, fout gegaan en er waren wat moeilijkheidjes, maar het weer zat in het. Ja, leek dat het niet echt mee zat, maar uiteindelijk is alles goed gekomen en, uh, en op zijn plaats gevallen. Dus het was een, een geslaagde ceremonie. De B-25? Ja. Ja, het was een surprise, want ik didn't expect het. En natuurlijk. He did much more flying than was also yeah. spoken yeah. of, uh, but very, very impressive that such an aircraft should fly over the very spot yeah. where a similar brother aircraft yeah. crashed so many years ago. My emotions come from my, my grandmother, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, was, uh, um, you know, uh, the matriarch of our family uh, and she um, told me so many stories about um, my great uncle when I was growing up. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. You know, as far as you can say, our dedication is brilliant, but it was well done, it's well organized and uh, everyone's been ever so kind. Couldn't, couldn't want for more. Yeah, it's uh, been a really um, great uh, honor first to, to come here and, and meet so many great people. Yeah. And then to um, kind of complete that circle. The work that had been put into this ceremony was superb. It was a very effective, very, very heartfelt, and I very much enjoyed it.